In the majestic old growth forests of Tasmania, it's a good thing conservation biologist Dayan Stajanovic isn't scared of heights. For me, when you're at the top of an enormous forest giant and you can see the ocean on one side and snow-capped mountains on the other, I would never take an office job. But all is not as tranquil as it seems. So I climb trees and I see dead nest after dead nest after dead nest. There's a surprising war between two unlikely combatants, the showy swift parrot and the shy sugar glider. And the battle is all about real estate. Magnificent trees like this Tasmanian blue gum are absolutely vital to the many animals that use its hollows to nest and breed. But it takes at least 150 years for these hollows to form. And that's the problem. There's just not enough of these old trees left. Old growth forest has been decimated by logging and land clearing. In the fierce competition for dwindling real estate, the deceptively sweet sugar glider is literally eating the swift parrot out of house and home. We have to act because we've only got 16 years before the species is functionally extinct. Of all the birds on the planet, there are only three migratory parrots. Endemic to southeast Australia, the swift parrot is one of them. Noisy, active and a voracious feeder, its estimated population has fallen to around 1,000 breeding pairs, making it one of Australia's rarest birds. Every swift parrot in the world flies to Tasmania in the summer to breed. So there's this key moment in time when the entire population is funnelled into a tiny bottleneck, which is Tasmania. During the breeding season, they feed only on flowering blue gums and black gums. But these trees don't flower every year. Unlike a lot of birds, swift parrots focus on a, on a really variable resource and so they move around the landscape and so you can have hundreds of kilometres separating places where swift parrots breed. So you know where they might be yes. or they could go, but you don't know they're there until yeah, exactly. they actually turn up. Exactly. For Dayan and fellow researcher Matt Webb, this annual moving target makes swift parrots a challenge to study. Over the last decade, They've been monitoring a thousand different sites every year across the entire southeast of Tasmania. One of the really important things that's uh, come out of that work and the modelling that we've done is that really it's only a small fraction of the breeding range that's actually available each year and it's due to these flowering patterns. Although it's just turned spring, it's still a bit early for Swifties to arrive. Just in case, we check one of their favourite haunts, a park at Port Huon, just south of Hobart. There's some movement up there. There, kind of... there. What is it? First, Swifties. First, first Swifties of the year. Fair yeah. yeah. I can't believe it's luck. <laughs> the new arrivals feed frenetically on black gum flowers. Once they pick an area where there's good flower, they then have a second requirement of old forest, which has hollow bearing trees because for parrots don't nest anywhere, they nest in tree hollows, but they don't just nest in any old tree hollow. They like a small entrance to exclude predators. They like a deep chamber of about 40 centimetres or so, so that they can put their eggs and nestlings as far away as possible from the entrance. And they need about 12 to 15 centimetres of floor space, so they can put three or four nestlings in there and mum can sit next to them without being too crowded. On top of that, the chances of finding just the right hollow close to flowers are low. Our research has shown that of the available tree cavity resource, only about 5% of available hollows are suitable. Only one in eight mature trees actually fits the bill for swift parrots. Although wildfires take a toll, it's industrial logging, land clearing and firewood harvesting that are most responsible for reducing the number of hollow bearing trees. And I mean, not so long ago, this whole region would have been covered by amazing wet eucalyptus forest, old growth trees, you know, three or four metres diameter is the average tree. But 
clearly what we're walking through now is, you know, not quite like that anymore. It's, it's dominated by trees that are no thicker than toothpicks, really. And unfortunately, that old forest provided an incredibly rich resource for hollow nesting birds like swift parrots. When Dayan began studying the swift parrot's decline, he knew that habitat loss was involved, but it couldn't account for the carnage he began to see. I came back one week and half of the nests had been killed and there were just female parrots that had just been torn apart and egg fragments and it was just a mess. He installed movement-sensitive cameras and trained them on the parrot hollows. What the cameras recorded was totally unexpected. To Dayan's astonishment, the culprits were sugar gliders. I love sugar gliders. Who doesn't love sugar gliders? But to see them as the perpetrator of these really grisly predation events, it was shocking. Sugar gliders were devouring not only the eggs and the chicks, but the nesting females as well. We now, over five years of researching this phenomenon, have quantified that approximately half of the adult female swift parrots get eaten every year. And this level of predation is just so severe that the swift parrot population can't tolerate it. He's found a strong correlation between predation rates and loss of old growth forest. In places where old growth has been reduced to as little as 20% of the available forest cover in an area, Predation by gliders can reach 100%, which means every bird dead, every nest fails. In areas where the old growth forest is much higher, survival for swift parrots can be higher than 90%. With less real estate to go round, there's increased competition for nesting space. But what's going on? Could it be that sugar gliders aren't supposed to be here? It's long been thought that sugar gliders were introduced from the mainland in the 1830s, but no one knew for sure. Until now. Using tissues from museum specimens, Cat Campbell compared genes from the Tassie sugar glider with those from the Big Island. The Tasmanian individuals that I sequenced are identical to individuals from the mainland found in Victoria and South Australia. The genetic evidence confirms that in Tasmania, Sugar gliders are an introduced animal outside their natural range. While sugar gliders are now common throughout the state, the good news for swift parrots is that they haven't made it to the surrounding islands, like here at Bruni. Swift parrots that nest on the islands, on average, have extremely high success rates. In excess of 99% of the birds that nest on Bruni Island do really well. As it turns out, Bruni is also a safe haven for another threatened bird facing a similar plight to the swift parrot. With a name longer than its body, the 40 spotted partalote is one of Australia's smallest birds. It lives only in Tasmania, it's endangered, its population is declining, and it's now mostly restricted to just a few islands, like here at Bruni Island. 100 nesting boxes have been installed to provide more nesting opportunities for the vulnerable partalote. They've had a really high rate of use, so at least half of those boxes get used annually by 40 spots. And there's clear evidence that partalotes, A, will use boxes, B, can rear their nestlings successfully, and C, can occupy new locations where they didn't used to be because of hollow limitation. This successful tactic inspired Dayan's colleague and wildlife photographer, Henry Cook, to do something similar for swift parrots. Capitalising on the bird's charisma, Henry set up a crowdfunding campaign. <laughs> it seems a bit mad at first, but uh, we wanted some serious numbers of nest boxes because doing things in small amounts, not really worth it. So we went for a thousand nest boxes and enlisted support from some of Australia's foremost political cartoonists, like John Kadelka. I think people tend to respond to a drawing sometimes more than, um, you know, being told about it or a photograph. And, you know, you can kind of give a personal view of what's going on and, uh, you know, you can put some words with the pictures. Initially set a target of 40 grand to, to crowdfund and we ended up getting $73,000. $73,000 in eight weeks but the first 40 grand was achieved in three days. The response from the public was just unbelievable. 
That crazy dream of a thousand nest boxes has become a reality. 500 boxes for the 40 spotted partalote and 500 for the swift parrot are now under construction. And today, they're starting to be deployed on glider-free Bruni to give the birds a boost. What's the highest you've climbed? Higher than I'd admit to my mother on television. <laughs> <laughs> but even here, swift parrot habitat is still available for logging. This is nesting box number one, the first of 500 new breeding boxes to be installed for the swift parrot. And this is in the safe neighbourhood of Bruny Island, where there are no sugar gliders. The real challenge is across the water in mainland Tasmania. There, parrots have to contend with both logging and gliders. Based on our models of population viability of the swift parrot, within three generations, which for the swift parrot is only 16 years, that rate of predation by sugar gliders on the nesting females is likely to lead to a population collapse of up to 94%. While the nest boxes aren't yet glider proof, they'll help Dayan and his team learn more about glider behaviour and buy time for the parrots. And they're going one step further to protect individual parrot nests in glider-infested areas. He's trialling lethal traps for sugar gliders, as used to control feral brush-tailed possums in New Zealand. Well, this is the very first time that we've trialled this in Australia. It's a kill trap called Good Nature Traps, and they're this ethical trap. It's early days, and first he must ensure the traps will only target gliders. What's a bit of a relief to me is to see that the pygmy possums are just walking past. Yep. Controlling sugar gliders is not a decision taken lightly. But that's the dilemma we face while swift parrot habitat continues to be lost. The swift parrot population appears to be in freefall. And as a conservation biologist, I have two options. I can continue to monitor them into extinction and do nothing, or we can investigate techniques that might work, may not necessarily be palatable to everybody, but might offer a solution to prevent the extinction of one of Australia's most iconic species. Mm -hmm.